Good afternoon and welcome to the Midday News. Here's what we have in the bulletin. Two men arrested and five guns seized in Clarendon joint police operation. Family seeks justice over police fatal shooting in St. Catherine. And later in sports, leaders Mount Pleasant play bottom of a table lime hall in JPL Centre in Derby. Thank you for joining us. I'm Shane Masters and here are the details. Five guns have been seized by detectives attached to the Counterterrorism and Organized Crime Division, CTOC, in Oliver Gardens, also known as Farm Clarendon. The weapons include four handguns and one Uzi submachine gun. Two men have also been arrested. Their identities have been withheld pending further investigations. The farm community is a known crime hotspot in the parish. The police say it was a targeted operation. Superintendent Carlos Russell is head of the Clarendon Police. Yes, it was a targeted operation, intelligence-led operation. You know, as part of our continued action against um, gangs and guns, and um, so we, they, that this is a part of that operation, targeted some of our, the gangsters that are operating in our space. And as you know, in recent times, we have been having some, some incidents um, that have been spreading to other parishes in Era Tree. And um, we have also seen where there was also some threats that, that have gone out, um, threats against police officers and other civilians. And as such, um, we would have targeted some of those criminals that are, we believe are involved. And um, those operations led us here. And um, these persons are now in custody and these firearms found. The threats follow the death of two men, Christophine Gardner and Siobhan Hall, who carried out a robbery at Trial Square in St. Elizabeth on Christmas Eve. Police see a third suspect wanted in connection to the robbery frequents the farm community in Clarendon. A St. Catherine family is appealing for justice after their relative was fatally shot by police. The family says they're living in fear in their own homes. But as Amoy Harriet reports, the deceased man was a suspect in a triple murder in the parish. While some people were celebrating Christmas and ringing in the new year, relatives of 38-year-old Jermaine Blake were mourning his death. The family told TVJ News that shortly after 12 o'clock on the morning of December 23, Blake was fatally shot by police officers who barged into his home on Dallas Lane while he was asleep with his six-year-old daughter. They say he was unarmed and killed in cold blood. Frustrated and in need of justice, the family staged a protest at the intersection of Burke Road and White Church Street in Spanish Town earlier this week. They say they are still living in fear. These people who we say are our protectors, they are wicked and they are liars. The family alleges that prior to Blake's death, the police repeatedly threatened to kill him as they suspect he was involved in a triple murder in Lime Tree Grove in the parish. Blake allegedly reported the matter to the Independent Commission of Investigations, Indicom, but the threats continued. <laughs> And you're half dead before Christmas, right out there, so. And then make sure so they say to us, so we feel afraid because we're not we feel afraid to live with him around here because they're going to kill away. And the, the police stand up about this, a DJ pan in tune, me AK, I go beat, and you're going to go to sleep, and you're going to rest in peace, yeah. When TVJ News spoke to Commissioner of Indicom Hugh Faulkner, he provided this account of the December 23 incident. The police, they have provided an account which stated that they pursued a man who subsequently pointed a firearm in their direction and they responded to that action. The police further reports that a firearm was recovered. However, in the absence of body-worn camera footage or CCTV footage, Indicom relies on eyewitness accounts to provide additional clarity. As it relates to the alleged report filed by Blake, Our preliminary checks do not indicate that Indicom has commenced any investigation into a report received from Mr. Blake. We are still making checks, but so far our case management system has not reflected the same. Amoy Harriet. TVJ News.
urgent appeals for the Noise Abatement Act to be strictly enforced against churches in the island. This comes as residents in one Westmoreland community complain that their lives have been disrupted by a church in the community, which operates until late at night. Kelisha Williams has that story. It's apparent that they probably have turned up the music. So this is in my bedroom now with the recording going. And they are probably have turned up the music now again. A frustrated resident from Barclay Street, Westmoreland, explaining the ordeal of living meters away from a revival church. The church, which has been operating from this tent, relocated here in November 2023, pending the construction of a new building. But the resident told us that her life has been disrupted since. She stressed that she became concerned when the church started its convention on November 5. That Sunday night, they did not end service until 2 a.m. the Monday morning. I teach at Belmont Academy. I could not go to work the morning. I wrote a letter that same Monday morning to the superintendent of police outlining what transpired and that is how it all started. They go turn the music down. They go up until 2, 3 o'clock in the mornings. It is a nuisance to the community. She told us that after making reports to the police, she was told a meeting was held with the pastors of the church and her concerns were being addressed. But up to Tuesday night, she said nothing changed. And her mother, a cancer patient, and other senior citizens in the community have been most affected. Right now, my mother has bags under her eyes. She was literally crying this morning, saying that she couldn't sleep last night. She's tired. She's exhausted. That elderly gentleman is saying He's not against the church. He's just saying that they need to be able to start at an appropriate time and end at an appropriate time and turn it down. The Noise Abatement Act outlines a 2 a.m. cutoff time for all events, and there's no exemption for churches. During certain periods, though, the government will allow certain events to go beyond 2 a.m. But there are concerns that churches are being given what is seen as special treatment. The church is getting away with a lot because I am sure if it was a party or a dance keeping over there, the police would have come and they would have taken the selector's computer and him locked up and they would have taken the sound system. That is not the case where the church, I think the church is operated as if they are above the law because if they are a Christian and it's church and it's God, they are untouchable. When we spoke to one of the pastors of the church, we were told the church has responded to the concerns of the residents and measures have been taken to prevent disruptions to the community. Kelisha Williams, TVJ News. Following a year marred by crime and disasters, church leaders are placing a special focus on unity for 2024 and want Jamaicans to join them in doing so. The charge was given at the annual Heal the Family, Heal the Nation church service in St. Catherine on Wednesday. The initiative has been ongoing for 18 years and is also seen as a national day of prayer. Prime Minister Andrew Honus and the leader of the opposition, Mark Golding, are expected to attend the special church service later today. Now, TVJ News spoke with founder of Power of Faith Ministries International, Bishop Delford Davis. There are those who think that a spiritual engagement in a nation is not really very significant are bearing the fruits but i'm happy that we are here i mean the church because if church if the church was not here praying and fasting ministering in all the ways that we do i mean i wouldn't want to be living here in jamaica one leading local economist is this afternoon warning that the country could find itself worse off if politicians stop turning to the NHT for budgetary assistance. The contentious matter was discussed by Dr. Adrian Stokes. The details in this report. The drawdown of funds from the National Housing Trust, NHT, is set to end in 2026. But there is a view that if that should stop, there could be serious budgetary consequences for the country. According to the NHT, over the last 20 years, a total of $126.7 billion have been taken from the coffers of the Housing Trust. That is expected to climb to $155 billion by March 2026. Economist Dr. Adrian Stokes says due to a number of changes in the fiscal space, stopping such drawdowns would not be advisable. 
He noted, for instance, the increases in public sector wages and the priorities of the government, such as education reform, as well as the investments in national security and road infrastructure. Dr. Stokes says before Jamaicans criticize the government for its position, they should consider whether there has been value from the drawdowns. We have seen where the national debt has been reduced dramatically. We're talking about, at the end of the current fiscal year, that the GDP will be below 80%. That's massive. We're talking about the country having its highest credit rating ever from S&P. We're talking about other macro um, indicators that are trending in the right direction. So the, the, the assessment of the policy at this stage has been a real success. But what's his suggestion? The, the policy should, should look at ways to attract private capital into construction and, and also into the private mortgage market um, and continue to um, use those funds to fund other national priorities, including national security. We all agree as a country that where we are with national security is, is not where we would like to be. And I think from a cost-benefit perspective, that's a better usage of those funds as opposed to leaving it at the NHT, where, in fact, there hasn't been any obvious adverse impact to how the NHT has operated over these years. The drawdowns from the NHT are being made through the 2020 Amendment of Legislation governing the NHT, the amendments were made to allow the government to get $57 billion from the Housing Trust over a five-year period to cushion the effects of the COVID-19 outbreak. When asked if this will affect Jamaicans seeking housing through the NHT, Dr. Stokes said no. Hal Shane Burke, TVJ News. And it's time for a break here on the Midday News. Stay with us. More stories when we return. Welcome back to the Midday News. An investigation has started into a security breach at the Bank of Nova Scotia BNS on Nutswood Boulevard in New Kingston. The bank says the break-in happened at the office after closing hours on Tuesday. We were told broken glass were discovered at the property Wednesday. The bank, in a release, added it is working with law enforcement in the investigation and has condemned the incident. The institution, which usually opens to the public at 8.30 a.m., was not able to do so at that time. The decision was eventually taken by the bank's leadership to close a branch for today. Now, this caused significant inconvenience to scores of customers who lined up outside the bank on Wednesday. Persons are being asked to use other branches, such as the nearby Ligony branch, until operations resume at the New Kingston facility on Thursday. Now, we will have more in the story in business during primetime news later this evening. A 19-year-old woman was discovered hanging from a rope in Islington, St. Mary, on Tuesday. It is suspected she committed suicide. She has been identified as Tamika Atherton, otherwise called Nikki, of Sports Road in Islington. It is reported that family members found her hanging from a tree in her yard. Reports say Miss Atherton also attempted to commit suicide late last year, but was unsuccessful in doing so. Now, if you or someone you know is struggling with their mental wellness, please contact the Mental Health and Suicide Prevention Helpline at 888-NEW-LIFE or 888-639-5433. And it's now time for the Business Minute. Student accommodation providers 138 Student Living realized increased profit for its 2022 to 2023 financial year. For the 12 months to September last year, the company made $343 million after tax. That's in comparison to the $318 million profit for 2021-2022. 
The audited financial statement for the company also showed an increase in overall revenue. Inflows amounted to $1.3 billion, compared with $1.19 billion for the year ended 2022. During the year, 138 started to see a full rebound in occupancy as UWI resumed full face-to-face -face operations. The company also raised more capital via an additional public offer. Further afield, India's top court has rejected pleas to set up a new panel to investigate the U.S. firm's allegations of fraud against billionaire Gautam Adani's companies. In January 2023, Heidenberg Research had accused the firm of brazen stock manipulation and accounting fraud. The court set up a committee in March that year to oversee an investigation into the allegations. In May, the panel said that the regulator had so far drawn a blank in the inquiry. The Supreme Court on Wednesday asked the regulator to finish its investigation within three months. And that's it for the Business Minute. And here is Shamela Poulain with a preview of what's coming up in this evening's health report. Health reports, we look at adult vaccinations. The people you spend time with may not be protected. So if they get something, they can share it with you. And because both of you are vulnerable and they may have a more aggressive infection with a higher level of germs in their body, so easier to spread, then even though you have some protection, but your protection is less, you're more likely to get it. And then you can share it with your family. And if you have young children, in your household, then that becomes an additional problem because they may not yet be fully vaccinated. That's the health report in primetime news at seven. And now for today's health living tip, sit upright during the immunization, relax your arm and stay calm. If you're feeling anxious, take slow, deep breaths. Time now for the top regional and international stories. In the region, the daughter of a Barbados member of parliament was granted bail on drug and money laundering charges when she appeared in court Tuesday morning. She is 21-year-old Tanil Rowe, daughter of MP Neil Rowe. She was charged with possession, trafficking, intent to supply and importation of cannabis. She is scheduled to reappear in court on February 20. On the international scene, U.S. Senator Bob Menendez has been accused in a new federal indictment of accepting bribes from Qatar. The allegations accuse him of a corruption scheme from 2021 to 2023. Federal prosecutors allege in the indictment that Menendez accepted gifts in exchange for comments praising the Qatari government. He has faced growing calls to resign. And police in Utah in the U.S. are investigating the death of a man who crawled into a plane engine at the Salt Lake City Airport on Monday. The airport says 30-year-old Kyla Effinger got onto the secure ramp area of the airport through a terminal emergency exit and crawled into an aircraft engine that was not running. He was later found unconscious. And those were the top regional and international stories. I'm Amoy Harriet. And we head to a quick break. When we come back, Spencer Darlington will have your midday sports report.